Bonjour à tous et euh, bienvenue au CCA. Je suis Martine de Blatter, je suis la directrice euh, associée de la collection au CCA et nous sommes très heureux de vous accueillir ici. Nous sommes ici pour partager avec vous le travail que nous avons accompli jusqu'à présent sur archive, la, les archives non numériques. Et nous souhaitons euh, répondre aux questions que vous nous avez envoyées euh, pour préparer cette journée, journée, mais aussi en soulever de nouvelles. Je poursuivrai, je m'excuse en anglais, euh, comme cette session est diffusée en direct et euh, suivie par nos collègues euh, dans d'autres pays du monde. Welcome to all of you uh, and elsewhere to this seminar on coping with complex, which is the key I think here, um, complex born digital material, in which we wish to share with you um, the experiences we had so far here at CCA with processing and preserving born digital archives. I will introduce the speakers, um, our team, uh, after my introduction, and I want to thank the team now for organizing this day in collaboration with the other teams at the CCA from public programs, communication, and the digital. My introduction now is meant to give you context to what we have been doing so far and why we've been doing it. So at CCA, we've been asking ourselves over the past 20 years, I would say, um, when and why the digital has changed architecture. And I will come back to this question more in detail. But for the purpose of today's seminar, it might be also good to make this question broader for also because you are all here. How and when and why has the digital changed cultural and collecting institutions at large? And ultimately, how and can and should we prepare ourselves for the near future? As a historian, I like to understand how our current debate is formed and in which context we need to understand the discussions of today. And even though I remember, and I feel very old saying this, many previous discussions on the digital in collections, not just here, but also in my previous jobs, and, um, and how impossible it was, <clears throat> it has been very, purpose, uh, been very useful for the purpose of this talk to look back and to see when and how the digital came into our institutional lives to not leave it anymore. Historical digital problems will not just solve themselves, as we all know, so we really have to tackle this problem. As a community of archivists, librarians, historians, information and subject specialists, and curators. And it will work, change our work drastically. At CCA, we have been working more intensely, I would say, on this matter in the largest sense we could in the past six years, and we have, have made quite some progress. I dare to say now, in terms of preservation of born digital material. And I will explain in this talk, it started with a curiosity in uh, how digital changed architecture, not so much the preservation of it. But as we are besides a curatorial institution, also a collecting institution to support the curatorial discourse, we had to investigate this aspect too. Today is about the progress we made in that area. And we want to share with you all of this and hear back from you and your experiences. There are still a lot of questions and issues to figure out and to solve for us too. And we have made many mistakes over the years and learned from them. But I will say we did learn by doing and we were able to do so due to the support of the Montreal Cultural Development Grant awarded by the City of Montreal and the Quebec government, uh, Department of Culture and Communications. But we were also able to do so with the trust we were given by our donors, architects really, who gave us their files while we said from the beginning we weren't really sure how to treat those. And they still were able, um, trusted these files to us. And maybe it's good to keep in mind um, that this morning session is live streamed. And I imagine we have different audiences here and watching from elsewhere. Elsewhere, I think it's mainly our colleagues from architecture institutions, I hope and most likely some donors, and uh, our audience in the theater here in Montreal is a more general-oriented community of archivists and librarians, which is why I want to show you in this part how CCA's approach came about and in which context we did so. Clearly, that is specifically framed within the architecture discourse, and we are dealing with complex architectural files, but I'm sure you will find all similarities with your own institutional realities. As most of you know, CCA was established in 1979, around the same time that ICAM was established. 
I will speak about that a little bit later. While we opened the building in 1989, we started to receive born digital material, however, still on physical devices in the mid-90s as part of physical archives donated by architects, and most likely the oldest digital material dates back to 1988. We are not certain about this date because uh, we can all, only give reliable information on that once material has been processed, and not all of it has been processed yet. We'll come back to this problem later in the day. I think it's also, also useful to look at some dates to understand how the digital fits into a larger conversation and how to deal with archives. For many younger archivists, and I feel very old again to say this, descriptive standards are a given in the sense that they might think that ISAD and RAD have been around forever. In fact, that's not the case at all. But what surprised me uh, was to find out that developing standards and digital developments in fact happened at the same time while, as an institution, we were also moving from paper indexes to databases. When CCA received the first floppy disks, we were not really certain what to do with the digital material we received. In fact, we were not really interested in the digital material. We would describe the physical appearance of the objects in our finding aids, if you're lucky, and uh, in very general terms, such as three floppy disks and two tapes. And we did not identify the type of floppy disk or tape, and we were not always precise in specifying the quantity of each. The CCA was certainly not alone in this practice. None of the collecting institutions in the field of architecture and urbanism that I know knew really how to go about describing born digital archives or even how to correctly define the problem. Some considered it a question of migration without exactly knowing what the effect of migration was, while others focused on the issue of preservation. But preservation of what exactly? The device, the medium, the file. At first, some of us imagined that we would have to purchase every single type of computer and related software to open design files, or that we would have to migrate files to more recent software versions, knowing that we would lose context and data. How would we migrate material for which we did not even have the machines uh, or the software? And what about software <clears throat> that was no longer being developed? What we realized at that time uh, is that none of us was equipped in terms of resources, both human and uh, technical, and we needed a dip different type of archivists, architecture historians, and curators who were not there yet. As I mentioned, the practice of describing physical architectural archival holdings was also not so well developed, as I mentioned. As many collecting architecture institutions were established in the 1980s, a more in-depth discussion about archival descriptions for architecture only began in the early 1990s. The CCA received its first archives only after the building was opened in 1989. And similar institutions uh, opened around the same time, such as the Netherlands Architecture Institute in Rotterdam that opened in 1992 as a merger of three different institutions and therefore had a much longer archival collecting tradition, or the Architekturzentrum in Vienna in 1993. When the International Confederation of Architecture Museums, ICAM, as I mentioned, was founded in 1979, there were practical uh, discussions among members about how to store drawings, how to describe architecture drawings, and is a sketch a drawing or is a drawing a sketch, and how to create consistent vocabulary for what you see in a drawing is a house the same as a villa or a residence. These discussions seem mundane and simple, but they were very crucial for the interpretation of individual architectural drawings and their meaning within an archive or a collection. Just to say that many different discussions were held at the same time. An architecture museum or an architecture collection was not a given, it was a very strange beast. It was not until 1994 that the International Council of Archives published its first standard, the General International Standard Archival Descriptions. I'm sure you all know about that. And here in Canada, they're more co complex, I imagine, RAD um, rules, the rules for archival descriptions, <clears throat> was only developed early 1990s as well. It obviously took time for many institutions to adopt the standard, and even more time for museums. And the CCA found itself a little bit in between the two, with its hybrid collection that includes library holdings, archival holdings, a photography, a photography collection, and a print and drawings collection. All this to say that the idea of, or concept of descriptive standards for physical material is fairly young and was developed at the same time that architects start to use computers. 
as we all did probably. Thus, while standards for archival descriptions were being refined in the 1990s and, discussion, and discussed among architectural institutions for describing physical material, most institutions realized that soon they also needed to think about the born digital material they were receiving. So let's have a look what happened. From 2002 to 2007, the Institut Français d'Architecture, initiated in Paris, initiated the program uh, Governance, Architecture and Urbanism, a Democratic Interaction. It's a very nice name. We call it Gaudi, which was first joined by the Centre International pour la Ville, l'Architecture et le Paysage, CIFA, in Brussels, the Architecture Centre in Vienna that I mentioned, the Museum of Finnish Architecture in Helsinki, and later by other institutions such as the Netherlands Architecture Institute and the Deutsches Architektur uh, Museum in Frankfurt. It was and remained a collective European effort to gain expertise in how architecture practices were operating at, the, at that particular moment. However, they were not able yet to address the preservation of electronic records and bring it into practice. In 2003, more or less the same time, uh, the Art Institute of Chicago's Department of Architecture and Design undertook a study to address the requirements for archiving born digital material. One of their first conclusions was identified while collaborating with architecture practices, and I quote, we discovered that digital design tools have become an essential part of the design process and that digital images are central in the design's decision making. Many digital images that document key design ideas are never committed to paper, end of quote. So we all realized there would be a paperless future. One year later, the CCA in 2004 organized a seminar called Devices of Design, Architecture and Variable Media in collaboration with the Daniel Langlois Foundation for Art, Science and Technology, also based in Montreal. We realized that we were interested in not just a problem of collecting born digital material produced by architects, but first of all in the question, what does the use of architectural tools mean for architecture? Experts from various disciplines were invited to the symposium and the purpose was twofold, to understand the impact of our, on architectural history and theory and the increasingly widespread use of digital media and software, and on the other hand, to assess implications for the long-term management and maintenance of digital archives. Although both the Gaudi Initiative and the work of the Art Institute of Chicago were in collaboration with architecture practices, the question as to how digital tools and computers have changed architecture was not really answered. The motivation to work with practices was more to understand what architects did and how tools were used, but not so much why. Around this same time, the Frac Centre in Orléans, France, worked on a series of exhibitions and explorations on digital developments in architecture, and specifically in experimental architecture, to make it more even complicated. And by doing so, the Frac Centre has really made a significant contribution to addressing digital developments in architecture and therefore rewriting architectural history. One of the most influential efforts has been the exhibition held at the Centre Pompidou in 2003 and 2004, the non-standard architecture show. Back to Montreal. The Daniel Langlois Foundation further developed ideas about the problem of preservation of digital media in the arts, while the CCA continued to focus on the why question. Through their program, Documentation and Conservation of Media Arts Heritage, DOCAM, they developed guidelines and manuals for documentation and preservation of such media in museum collections. And you can actually still find them online. In 2007, MIT Digital Library Research Group and MIT's Department of Architecture started to investigate ways of creating a structure for preserving digital CAD files and the use of open source solutions to store and provide access to architectural re records. So they kind of moved a step forward. The facade project, as it was called, focused primarily on the specific characteristics that make computer-aided design documents, drawings and models, difficult to archive and preserve. The facade project investigated strategies for curating and preserving these particular files and made recommendations for the identification, migration, and emulation of three CAD models. However, all these discussions and case studies, and there are more than I show here, regarding digital preservation, especially for the architectural archives, remained quite theoretical. 
there were simply no solutions at the time for the loss of context caused by format migration, nor was emulation a feasible solution for most cultural heritage uh, institutions. For the CCA, defining a technical solution was never the most satisfying research question. We wanted to understand how digital technology had changed architectural ideas, practices, and theories, and we knew we had to start addressing this before the evidence was lost. It was only around 2012 that the CCA started to work on the topic again, and this time with a more defined plan, <clears throat> though still without a real full understanding of the significance of digital in architecture or its preservation, and we call this project Archaeology of the Digital. This program was initiated um, in collaboration with Los Angeles-based architect Greg Lynn. It began with a historical reading of digital architecture through 25 key projects from early experiments in the 1980s to work in the 2000s. These projects were devo developed by key protagonists of the debate on digital technology in architecture and each has influenced recent architecture history in its own way, while also creating particular future problems, of course, for preservation. It was not their aim, of course, but that happened. The research program as a whole resulted in an acquisition strategy for born digital material, leading to the formation of a born digital archive, three exhibitions, two print publications, as you see here, a TV show that is still online and that I really recommend you watching, as it's really funny, and a series of electronic publications on each of the projects that incorporated screenshots, videos, original born digital files from the archives alongside transcripts of the interviews between Greg Lynn and the participating architects. And Greg Lynn, you see here, was the show master. <clears throat> The acquisitions um, could not have happened without these curatorial projects and the other way around. And though the work at the CCA is often transversal between departments, I would say always, divisions and teams, archaeology of the digital had some unique challenges in this respect and required the collaboration of many in collection, in programs, publications, research, IT. I wish we had the digital department at that moment, but we didn't, but we would certainly have uh, collaborated with them too. We approach the difficulties with Born Digital Archives, first of all, from a curatorial point of view, meaning that while we wanted to address issues related to collecting digital material and find technical solutions, the focus and reason for this work remains to understand the projects in their context and their full complexity, and to study their role in shaping a new architectural culture. Exhibitions, publications, and interviews with all participants helped us to understand the projects, but also better understand ways of working and the use of a technology by them, which was crucial for processing the donated archives. The projects acquired included designs, both built and unbuilt, and architectural and technology, technological experiments. What brings them together is their use of computation and digital technologies in ways that change the practice of architecture at a moment <clears throat> of experimentation and play. Because the projects occurred over a span of more than 20 years, they also offer the ability to see how developments in technology affected architecture and the other way around. Clearly, the selection represents the ideas on digital technology and in architecture by Greg Lynn. And we have tried to kind of counterbalance this um, with a publication at the end of the project in which we included many different and other voices. Not planned really at first, the three uh, Archaeology of the Digital exhibitions ultimately followed a chronology. The first show in 2013 consisted of records and artifacts in numerous forms, CAD files in digital and printed forms, physical models, textual documents, uh, and some computing hardware contemporary to the projects being investigated. For a show on a digital practice, the exhibition was in fact quite analog, a lot of physical things. Reflecting the early stage of technologies that were used, the fact that many files had been lost and only existed as printouts, and the hybrid processes of the architects. For example, Frank Geary's practice of form finding with physical models and then recreating the designs in a digital space. We could go into that, but I'm not doing it today. 
The second exhibition, uh, Media Machines, uh, which opened in 2014, continued the first show's investigation on computation of a design medium, while shifting focus slightly to explore the practices made possible by experimentation and new technologies, again, such as interactive media and algorithm design. This shift can be seen in the design of the exhibition itself. Although Media Machine contained a number of large and complex physical pieces, such as this one by Mark Goldthorpe, the show also featured many, many more screens uh, than were in the first show. Still, digital materials were shown, not on modern, uh, high fidelity display, although this might look modern, but it isn't, in our view, but in forms that conveyed an archeological, archeological approach to the projects. Complexity and Convention, the third show in the series, opened in May 2016. Through the presentation of 15 projects this time, it demonstrated various uh, applications of technologies such as sophisticated CAD software, high fidelity visualization, and 3D printing in the design process. Whereas the cultural me curatorial method of the first two exhibition emphasized individual projects based on their distinct and clearly defined digital approaches, the method of the third exhibition was more synthetic. Aspects of multiple projects were presented together through different themes such as high fidelity 3D, structure cladding, data, photorealism, and typography and typology, topology. Archival material uh, was dissected and reassembled to provide a range of innovative design strategies from the recent past that have now actually become convention. The archaeology of the digital program as a whole has fostered research in a number of areas. In order to understand, to contextualize, and examine the projects, it was necessary to conduct research with the project creators. The architects of the 25 projects and many of their collaborators were interviewed to offer oral histories that establish context and provide insight into the projects. And um, to invite uh, in, in the projects. Uh, from a curatorial perspective, while simultaneously helping us to understand the digital material in the archives and how to interact with the files. The interviews, I mentioned them before, were supplemented by archival walkthroughs, as we called them, conducted via Skype, where the CCA curatorial and collection staff shared screens with the architects to better understand how their working practice is reflecting in the organization and makeup of the files. The resulting oral histories were included, as I mentioned, in the electronic publications that are still available online. They show altogether a wide variety of avenues that architects took using new digital tools to design their ideas and develop their architectural practice. And I think that is one of the largest challenges at the CCA with material with such an enormous technical variety. However, nearly all the archives consist of both born digital and analog materials, and they range in size from small project archives consisting of a few paper drawings and a handful of digital files to full archives consisting hundreds of linear meters of paper records and several hundred gigabytes of digital records. As a whole, the born digital component of archaeology of the digital archives comprises roughly five terabytes of data, and that's not our whole collection, that's just the project we received through Archaeology of the Digital. And it made up for millions of individual files that arrived at the CCA via network transfer services, such as the Dropbox and Transfer, and a wide range of original and do new digital storage media. So where are we now? This is the real topic of today, and what you have come for, I imagine. So I won't say too much in detail about that, but we have now secured preservation of incoming born digital material, and we continue to use ISAT to standardize uh, descriptions. We access files through CAD workstations located in our study room, which is loaded with a range of software, though not all that we need, uh, received as donations or purchased from software vendors. These stations are used both by staff and researchers to view, manipulate, and transform files. While our staff is mostly interested to see all digital files of one project or all projects by one architect, which is a typically, let's say, the top-down method um, dedicated by finding aids, starting at the collection level description and then moving uh, downwards in, until the appropriate material is found, we have seen a shift in users in searching born digital archives. 
Researchers from the digital humanity, humanities or media studies, for example, consult our Born Digital collection, and their research seems to have a much more quantitative fo focus, with questions such as how has 3D modeling software evolved over time, or I want to see all Maya files between, produced between 1992 and 1995, if that is at all possible, across different archives. Very different questions. And being able to answer these types of questions would require both a deep individual knowledge of our digital holdings and an endless time pouring through finding aids, and increasingly unscalable expectations due to the growing volume of available digital material. Aggregate descriptions typically used in finding aids also provide a kind of barrier to answering these extremely specific questions. And this led the CCA to develop to an open source digital archives it access interface tool, it's a mouthful, with art artifactual, which we call scope. And we will discuss it uh, in a minute. The paradox is that due to security restrictions and intellectual property considerations, born digital archival material can only be consulted in the CCA study room for the moment and unlocked work down station, unlocked workstations. In that sense, it is not so different from consulting a drawing by Scamozzi or the archive of Alvaro Siza here at the CCA. And for a reproduction or a loan request, we kind of follow the same um, uh, workflow as is required for physical material. So having described the international context in which CCA has been operating shows how already it was a challenge for new institutions like the CCA and our colleagues to process their paper finding aids, in a, a paper archives in a consistent way, while at the same time receiving the first born digital material at the same time, sorry. Also at the CCA, we were not just interested in solving a technocratic problem, as I said, but first and foremost, we wanted to understand what we were collecting and in which curatorial context, and this makes the whole project really complex for us. We would not have processed Born Digital Archives without the information coming from the curatorial research teams and the interviews related to the acquisitions. This elaborate work gave us insight into the creative process, as I mentioned, of architects and others involved in the design and the context and workflows of this design. It also shows the need for knowledge of obsolete computing hardware, software, file systems that few archivists or architectural historians like myself have. So instead, on waiting for all material to be processed and digital problems to be solved, to do exhibitions and publications, it was the other way around. The curatorial project, based on yet unprocessed material, has helped the digital archivists to understand the archives much better, I hope, later on. The good news is that since the start of this project, we have been able to access much more uh, digital material. I would guess, but I'm looking here at the team from 60% to 90%, more or less. What I have learned from this process, <clears throat> and mind you, we are still in the middle of you, middle of it, is that we have to understand the context of how and why material is produced. And in this case, that is a technological context for which not many people yet have the knowledge. It will require a much more technological approach in archival schools, I imagine, as well as in other fields such as architectural history. Though the basics of archival descriptions for digital archives uh, is not so different than from physical archives, it requires an understanding of the technology to be able to work with born digital material. At the time of Gaudi and the other initiatives, I would never have imagined that it would be technology that would solve the problem <clears throat> of preserving born digital archives. And yet, it is not just technology that solves the problem. The understanding of architectural technology architectural, technological, and historical context of these projects is absolutely crucial. And in my experience here at the CCA, where we collaborate and discuss the matter uh, continuously, we end up still having misunderstandings and misinterpretations. At the same time, the approach we have taken with our physical collection has helped us to define the stages and workflow for archiving and preserving born digital collections. Ultimately, the only way to go is to start doing it making mistakes and accept that small steps are still steps going forward. Having said that, I think we should start to look at these small steps, or big steps maybe. And with that, I want to introduce the team that will explain what we've done so far. We have um, 
We are very interested in uh, your comments and your questions and remarks during and after the session. And also from elsewhere, you can ask your questions and we'll make sure that they'll come to the podium. Our digital archivists, Mireille Nappert, uh, Alexandra Jokinen, and Stefana Breitweiser, and our former digital archivist, um, who now may call himself a librarian at Concordia, uh, Tim Walsh will explain in more detail the different steps they have taken. And with no further delay, please join me welcoming Stefana, Mireille, Alexandra, and Tim. Thank you. Microphone. Um, so to start with, uh, and before we're getting to our work, well, I first will thank Martine for a super interesting uh, introduction and put a, putting in context all of this. And um, so my name is Mireille, and I'll be a little bit introducing a few concepts about digital preservation before we talk about uh, what we've actually been doing, just to be sure we're all on the same page. Um, you have this beautiful cake here. Um, we're talking about... Uh, Preservation, which is an actually proactive process, as long as we'll have those holdings of born digital records, we will need to be acting upon them. Um, so whether it's to make sure we um, have control over them at the first stage, or whether we will know that in 10 or 50 years, 15 years, we'll have to move them from a database or from a server to another one. So it's never ending. Um, so one of the... Uh, one of the first things we actually do uh, when we get to um, when we actually get those nice little uh, media is uh, we do what we call disk imaging, la uh, création d'image disk. So the idea is to oops, uh, the idea uh, is to actually give um, have a capture. Uh, capture of everything that is on those media, whether it's hidden files, whether it's uh, files with dependencies, so we make sure we will not be breaking anything as uh, we go over our process. Um, one of the other things that uh, all presentation on digital preservation should cover. I will not go fully under this, uh, over this, but uh, there's a few concepts. So we base our field, our field is based on this model. Well, this is just one part of the model, actually, um, by the uh, Consultative Committee on Spatial Data Systems. Uh, so, it, and it has been reused uh, for our purposes. Um, the three main concepts I want to uh, highlight today is what we call the Submission Information Package, which is basically all the records or data that you want to uh, transfer to someone else and all the metadata that will uh, uh, allow uh, to um, co uh, conserve the actual um, context, original produ uh, context of the producer and the, the producing of the records. Uh, the other one, once we receive that, uh, we can actually go towards the uh, archival information package and actually add layers of metadata that will allow us to um, preserve this on a very long time. And finally, when we actually are ready to share and want to give access to other people, we have the dissemination information package, which again will have those little differences. Um, for example, it could be like a more friendly file format uh, to open instead of being like a very uh, obscure uh, format like Form Z. Well, maybe we'll have, uh, I don't know, extracted an image. We wouldn't do that because we want to uh, maintain. Um, want to allow researchers to have fully access to the original and complete version of the record. But if you want to show something on the, on the website, maybe you want something that is smaller. Um, how do we have those, uh, all those metadata elements in the archival world? What we've been using a lot is what we call uh, the Metadata Encoding Transmission Standard, so METS, which has been developed by the Library of Congress. And it's actually just an XML structure that you can, uh, that has different sections that are um, super important and relevant, but you can also insert there other metadata scheme that are more suitable for your uh, purpose. But you can also, and most of the time, we like to pair it with the premise, which will uh, include all preservation metadata to actually, when we have that ape, 
uh, for archival purposes. We want to manage it on the long term. So we'll be capturing metadata there on every action that is made on the actual records or the metadata, uh, if it's to transfer from a file format to another, for example, or if we decided to, uh, um, yeah, when you create a dip and, and so on. So one, another concept that I wanted to bring up to you this morning is the concept of checksums. Uh, in French, we would call it empreinte. Uh, so basically, it's a, num a series of numbers created by an algorithm that is going to identify without uh, mistake a uh, given a document or a uh, file. So this way, we can ensure if we have duplicates or that the file we receive from our donor uh, is actually the exact same that we still have in our holdings 10 years later. It will have the same signature. And so on. Yeah, another, um, I think I included this a bit more for, um, because we also have a French audience here, and the term CAD, which is maybe a bit more familiar in the English-speaking world, but uh, in, in French we would say dessin assisté par ordinateur. So uh, you will find uh, the CAD uh, acronym today, I think, a few times. Uh, so this is, most of uh, the records we have, well, a good, good chunk of the born digital records we have are actually uh, computer-aided design records in a variety, huge variety of uh, formats and from a huge variety of software. Uh, we'll also be mentioning, uh, well, Martina already mentioned it earlier, but we'll also be talking, uh, mentioning uh, emulation, which is basically a uh, in a given, in a modern computer, imitating the features, which is whether it's hardware or software, from a different um, set of uh, older sets of software. It can be still a modern uh, set of uh, machines, but basically we're just like, we push it in the new machine just to imitate something else. To this, I believe, I give the talk to Tim. Is that working? Yeah, okay, there we go. Good morning, uh, I'm Tim Walsh. I'm the digital preservation librarian at Concordia University just down the road. Um, and between 2015 and 2018, I was the, the CCA's first digital archivist. Um, and I'm very happy to be here speaking with you and, and back with my former colleagues today. Um, so as Martine mentioned in her very nice introduction, um, the CCA has been considering and interacting with issues of digital preservation since well before um, well, well before I joined the CCA and well before I even joined this profession. Um, and when I started here in June 2015, um, due to the efforts of colleagues like, uh, like David Stevenson, Glenn Brown, and Martina Amato, some of which might be here today or might be listening, um, the CCA had even already been pretty far along, conducting tests with Archivmatica, finding issues with uh, diacritics and French language characters and um, in other scripts besides Latin. Uh, so to say Japanese uh, writing, um, which, and we're already contributing those back to Archivmatica, so these are sort of issues that have been worked out in the prevailing years. Um, but nonetheless, um, before there was the digital preservation program at the CCA that we know now, including this like very lovely digital archives lab above, um, there were somewhat more <laughs> humble beginnings. Um, so the version of this before that was, was this. It's just two computers, pretty similar. Um, you know, before that, it was a, a lone bit curator machine in a, essentially a copier room. Um, I, of which I, I just mean to say, um, you know, we all start somewhere and we all start small, um, but that small step can, can really grow over time. Um, I also had the benefit of coming in um, with a pretty clear remit um, to process and make accessible for research all the records that we had collected through archaeology of the digital, um, and in so doing, develop the systems, the workflows, the policies, the staffing. Um, that is to say, the institutional capacity to responsibly collect, preserve, and make accessible to researchers the digital records of architecture and design. Um, as you can imagine, this was a long and multi-step process, uh, and one that required the participation of people all throughout the, the, the CCA. Um, and it's also very much ongoing and always will be. It's sort of the nature of digital preservation. Um, there's no benign neglect like papers. We can't put them in a box and expect them to be there for 100 years. Um, if at any point, for basically any reason, we stop being responsible stewards, it's kind of game over, which is a really, uh, I think, a radical shift in the way that we think about collecting our heritage. Um, 
However, and I hope this is what many of you in the audience take away from today, it's also eminently achievable, and I believe a deeply necessary process for our culture institutions to take if we want to keep or in even increase our cultural cachet and the value of the services that we provide to society at large, which has predominantly already made this shift 20 years ago. Um, you know, most of us, uh, you know, the, the paperless office never really came to be. It seems like it never really will be. But most of us predominantly do most of the business of our lives digitally and certainly at work. Um, in the early days for me here, uh, my day-to-day -day focus was spread across a few areas. Um, so one was experimentation with workflows for processing digital archives, um, using open source community-backed tools like BitCurator, Archivmatica, Bagger, and Droid, some of which my colleagues here will go over uh, a little later this morning. Um, another was developing policies, so both an institutional digital preservation policy um, as well as specific file format policies so that we know how to take care of all of the different types of assets that were coming into our custody. Uh, another was working with IT uh, to develop the necessary digital preservation repository and storage infrastructure to make sure that the digital collection was safe from threats uh, like bit rot, hardware failure, natural disaster, and even malicious behavior like hacking over a very long time window. When we're talking about records of enduring value, things that we've decided to take into our cultural institutions, um, the threat model is, is quite a bit different than day-to-day -day IT because we're talking about potentially a period of 50 years or 100 years. Um, so things that are very small risks in the short term turn out not to be so much over the long. Um, and of course, uh, also strategizing how we'd address preservation risks and issues specific to architectural records, um, such as computer-aided design or CAD and building information modeling or BIM files. Um, which have for a long time been seen as difficult edge cases by the digital preservation community writ large, um, and rightly so, for reasons including the high barrier to entry for being able to understand and interact with these files, uh, the complexity and the proprietary nature of the data and the file formats, um, and the lack of clear preservation file formats and migration pathways. Um, you know, the, our uh, community has been dealing with this for quite a long time, um, and even now, you know, 20, 25 years in, there's no real consensus for what the preservation file format of a CAD file would be, or, and, and no real way to automate that. Um, but in the end, in order to advance our practice forward, uh, we basically just had to get started. We had to try to apply these workflows and tools to real archives to see what worked, what didn't, how long task took, and how we might be able to train our existing staff or bring in some new staff in order to do this work of digital preservation. To this end, I myself processed one of the archives collected through Archaeology of the Digital, the Testa and Weiser project records. Um, this is a predominantly digital archive consisting of 3D models developed in software like Rhino and Maya, as well as some scripts in the Maya Mel scripting language that were written by the architects to programmatically design certain elements of the carbon tower. You can sort of see uh, one of the Maya models for this above, um, and the Strand Tower research products. Um, but also videos, raster images, Word documents, all the sort of normal stuff of our digital everyday lives. Um, and in addition, like Martine mentioned, um, this is a hybrid archive, like most of them are. So it's not just digital files, but also the more traditional stuff of architectural archives, uh, sketches, maquettes, uh, working drawings. Um, in this case, a quite sophisticated 3D printed model, which you know, there's a whole long story about what it took to do that in 2005 that I think we don't need to get into now, but there's an interesting history on its own. Um, shortly afterwards, we decided to continue to test our workflows by applying them to the digital component of the Foreign Office Architects Fall, which was being processed by Italia Olszewski. Um, this was a really interesting test case because both the volume of the material, in this case, the digital component had arrived on a couple hundred CDs, DVDs, and floppy disks, um, that the firm had put together uh, as part of a, an intentional archiving process about 10 years before, um, and because it gave us the opportunity to test out having one of our regular processing archivists arrange, describe, and preserve digital material alongside physical, which I think uh, is the sort of long-term goal, certainly was the original goal for us, and, and seems to be for the profession writ large, too. You know, one day we'll just all be digital archivists. Um, so from these test cases, we learned that our envisioned workflows largely worked, but that we still had a ways to go. Um, the many steps and software tools involved made the workflows really overly complex, difficult to train for, and increased chances for human error along the way. Um, and we were never really quite able to find satisfactory tools for certain stages of our workflow, like appraisal of disk images. Um, we also confirmed some things that we had long suspected. 
For example, that traditional archival principles such as aggregate description and original order very much do still apply with these new formats, as they always have with every kind of format that's come along. But the digital records do come with their own challenges and their own affordances. Um, for example, that they already come with metadata in machine-readable forms, so the records can be made to describe themselves in some way, which makes a, a sort of item-level description uh, much more feasible um, if you're able to automate some of the more factual elements of it. Um, the work also confirmed that being able to open and interact with several decades worth of CAD files for our archivists, curators, and our researchers alike uh, was highly dependent on having the software necessary to be able to accurately render a wide range of formats. This approach of ensuring access by focusing on the software more than the file formats themselves um, is quite a bit different than the approaches of previous projects like Facade and the Art Institute of Chicago project that Martine mentioned. Um, and time will tell, but I suspect that focusing on retaining a small set of software environments, the operating systems, the hardware emulators, uh, the CAD software itself, uh, so say 10, 15, 20 different environments, is probably gonna be a lot more sustainable than having to, uh, to, to migrate every single individual file that comes into our collections, which in the case of just the archeology, span the digital archives is, is somewhere around a million. Uh, so if you think about the computational power and the expense required for those two different things, they scale very, very, very differently. Um, and this is particularly true, I think, that this approach will be successful um, if we can find cross-institutional ways to share software libraries so that not every individual institution has to build this infrastructure and these software libraries themselves. Um, and luckily, our colleagues uh, at Yale University and the EASY Project, uh, and the Software Preservation Network, and others are, are addressing these issues. So I think, I think there's a really promising future for that ahead. <laughs> This was a picture for World Digital Preservation Day last year. It's quite nice, all of us holding the, our favorite sort of weird old formats from the archives. I don't know, um, how many people here have seen a Bernoulli disc before? Or Bernoulli box, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> um, so the final element of planning how we'd go about doing this work of preserving a million digital files is one that I think um, is most often overlooked or under-resourced. Um, when planning for digital projects in our cultural institutions, and, and that's staffing. Um, simply put, and I think this is true for every library, archive, and museum um, that's not dealing with sort of historical collections capped at a certain date, um, being successful in digital preservation and transitioning to a world that's long ago become focused on the digital means scaling our human resources uh, alongside technology. Um, more simply put, it means that really any institution who wants to collect and preserve the digital records of the modern world is going to have to retrain existing staff and almost certainly hire for new positions as well. Um, for any institutions wanting to do this at any kind of scale, uh, my experience says that success almost certainly depends on having more than one singular digital preservation expert. Um, whether that means you know, developing new teams or training to spread this knowledge throughout uh, existing staff. Digital preservation is really highly skilled, complex work, requiring all the domain knowledge of being an archivist or a librarian or a curator, uh, all the domain knowledge of working in a specific field like architecture, um, as well as detailed knowledge of how computers and storage systems work at a pretty low level, from file formats to databases to file systems to the particular materialities of digital, different types of storage media. Um, even with the automation of workflows and wonderful tools like Archimatica and BitCurator, the success and the impact of the work is highly contingent on just having enough skilled people to put in the time to do the work well. Um, if you look at the results of the recent Carl survey on digital preservation in Canada, I think this is something that we're struggling with as a nation uh, in Quebec and in Canada. Um, despite about 20 or 25 years of, of discussion and, and digital preservation literature, um, but Canada's hardly alone in this. Um, former Stanford professor and the locks engineer David Rosenthal um, wrote recently about the sunsetting of the Digital Preservation Network, uh, which was a sort of distributed digital preservation storage network in the United States. Um, and, and I really, I think this is pretty crucial to highlight. He said, quote, preservation is not a technical problem, it's an economic problem. We know how to do it, we just don't want to pay enough from continually decreasing library discretionary funds to have it done that way. Um, I find this unfortunate. Um, and I hope that it's something that administrators and funders um, who are listening to this today or, or you know, on YouTube at some point uh, will consider after we leave today. Um, luckily, here at the CCA, um, I was very fortunate to have higher-ups who understood the importance of this work and who, with the generous support of the city and the province, were willing to commit some pretty serious institutional resources to make sure that it happened and to develop a world-class program. 
Um, when we compared the material collected through archaeology, the digital, to our estimates for how long it would take to arrange, describe, and preserve digital archives, we estimated that it would take uh, hiring a team of four, three digital processing archivists, um, and a digital archives technician for two years to accomplish the goals. And starting in 2017, that's exactly what we did. That's uh, the team you see here. Um, so before we move on to um, Alex and Stefano and Mireille talking about some of the details of the tools and the workflows, which I hope you'll all find very helpful in a, in a practical sense, um, I want to speak a little bit about how we developed, refined, and documented these workflows. Now, having clear workflows was really crucial to the project's success, not least because it made onboarding and training a team of four and making sure that we were all on the same page uh, much, much easier. Um, to this end, in the lead up to hiring the Digital Archives team, I documented every step of our workflows in an internal wiki. This included everything from some high-level principles and recommended readings um, to detailed step-by-step -step instructions with pictures for how to conduct each step um, using each software tool in our workflows, from capturing data from media such as floppy disks and zip disks via disk imaging, how to use write blockers to make sure that our modern computers didn't accidentally change things on floppy disks or zip disks as we plug them in, um, to generating reports to aid in appraisal, to ingesting files into Archivematica, the digital preservation software that we adopted, uh, and performing quality assurance. These workflows were certainly based on a good amount of experimentation, um, but really also would not have been possible had it not been for some of the communities of practice and the projects shown above, and from the generosity of our colleagues here in North America and all over the world sharing ideas, their own workflows, their own policies and software tools, uh, you know, whether that's on conferences, publications, or um, uh, pro tip Twitter, that seems to be where I learned like half of my professional knowledge. <laughs> Um, so as of 2016 or so, it was pretty clear that there were some gaps between how we wanted to work and the tools that were available to us. Um, there are all kinds of ways to respond to a problem like this, um, so you know, my take is, is really a personal one. Um, but for me, the, the way forward seemed clear. I wanted to make the tools that we wanted to see in the world and share them back as open source software to the communities who had shared their efforts and work that had made our project possible in the first place. Um, so that's what we did. Um, in moments here and there during the day, nights and weekends, um, I tried to take pretty rudimentary knowledge of Python that I had at the time um, and make some tools that could potentially fill some of these gaps for the CCA and the broader community. Um, and I'll talk about some of these tools shortly after Alex gives a bit more context about, um, about some of the tools and ecosystems for you. Um, but again, I want to stress this was really only possible because of existing cooperative efforts like the BitCurator environment, of which the CCA is a member of the BitCurator Consortium, which keeps that uh, sustainable. Um, script repositories and a kind of growing field, and I think this is a, a bit what Martine was alluding to, of, um, to use Ashley Bluer's term terminology, archivist developers. It's like at a certain point when the comp problems are complex enough, um, you basically just have to learn how to program to, to solve them, which is, I think, a new thing, certainly, and, and something the schools haven't quite caught up with yet. Um, so for those of you listening who might have similar aspirations, let me just say, um, if you stick with this approach long enough, you may one day find that your code's not quite as amateurish as it once was. Uh, and we all kind of benefit just from the shared experimentation and, and tool sets. Um, and with that, I will uh, pass it on to Alex. Thank you, Tim. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Alex Jokinen. Um, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about what work as a digital processing archivist at CCA actually looks like. But before I do, um, let me introduce you to the processing environment that we are set up with in our digital lab. Um, as, digital, as digital processing archivists, we perform the bulk of our work on three main BitCurator stations, like the one you see here. As Tim mentioned, BitCurator is a Linux-based operating system stacked with a suite of open source digital forensics tools that are used to process born digital materials. Some of the tools we use most within the BitCurator environment include Gaimager, a tool used for disk imaging, and the preferred tool for disk imaging at CCA, Bagger, a tool for transferring digital materials safely, Bulk Extractor, a forensics tool that can find and extract important data, such as credit card numbers and email addresses, ClamTK, an antivirus scanner, HFS Explorer, um, a tool that can read Mac formatted media, and of course, Tim's Brunhild, a characterization and reporting tool that he will get into more about later, as well as numerous different command line tools and scripts that all work to help manage born digital material. 
So at CCA, we use these bit curated machines to create disk images, extract and analyze data, investigate and report on files, identify and address any potential issues, organize directories of files and assign identifiers, as well as a handful of other activities that allow us to understand and really gain control over the records. These machines are also where we eliminate, arrange, and package digital archival material into SIPs and ingest those SIPs into um, our digital repository, Archivematica, for long-term storage. On one of our bit curator stations, we have a floppy disk. We have floppy disk readers for three and five and a half inch floppies, which we use to create disk images with a piece of built-in technology called a cryoflux. <laughs> A Cryoflux is a floppy disk controller card developed by the Software Preservation Society for imaging a wide variety of legacy floppies. What is special about the Cryoflux is that it has the capacity to capture data off any type of floppy disk despite its format. In addition to the Cryoflux, we also have a number of external floppy readers and zip disk drives that we can use for imaging. Um, and we do this with the help of write blockers to ensure that data on the disk cannot be modified. In our lab, here we are. in our lab, we are also equipped with a Microsoft Windows machine that you can see here, and we use this station to also create disk images, but specifically to create images using Forensics Toolkit Imager or FTK Imager, a free but proprietary imaging tool that forms part of the larger Forensics Toolkit software suite. At CCA, we use FTK Imager to create disk images for media which bit curators and guy Imager is unable to image. On the same machine, we have also installed a robot called a NIMBY, which is basically a batch CD ripper for automating the creation of disk images. We have yet to really master using the NIMBY, but in theory, we will use it to image large accessions of optical media. So this next machine is what we refer to as our CAD workstation. On this computer is a number of specialized CAD um, and design software that we use to access and investigate all different types and versions of architecture files. Examples of some of the software um, on this machine include AutoCAD and the Autodesk Suite, Rhino, Maya, the Adobe Suite, Softimage, and FormZ, among some others. And last but not least, we also have a Mac environment that we use to open files extracted from Apple or HFS formatted media. So all of this technology is used early on in our workflows to carry out pre-processing activities, which assist in the appraisal and, evalu and evaluation of born digital archives. So some of these activities include creating and analyzing disk images from optical physical media, extracting files from disk images and reporting on logical files, highlighting any major is issues such as unidentified file formats or corru corrupted date stamps, and moving files to a processing location. The result of these activities will be a copy of working files to arrange and describe, as well as detailed reports to aid in the arrangement, description, and preservation of the digital archive. I should also add that in addition to all of these tools and activities we use to understand the digital records, we also gather knowledge from the record creator in order to fill in the gaps and give the material um, additional context. So one of the ways we do this is that when CCA acquires born digital records, we ask our donors to answer a questionnaire to identify things like file, file names and structures and other important information to help us understand what we have. As an example, this slide shows the last page of our questionnaire, which contains a checklist of different software that we ask the donor to identify for each stage of the development process in an architectural project. Often, the survey comes in very handy for us and saves us from a lot of guesswork while processing. So that, that's back to you, Jim. <laughs> OK. Um, so I'm going to talk about two tools or two set of software tools um, that we developed as part of this project um, and that I will point out at the beginning are open source and on GitHub and already used by quite a number of institutions besides the CCA. So if you're thinking about um, you know, starting a program of yourself or uh, experimenting, they, they might be things to look into. Um, so the first of the tools that I'll, I uh, developed that we'll talk about today is Brynhilde. 
Um, so around 2015, 2016, we tested file identification and profiling tools uh, for digital files. You know, so essentially tools that would take an input of a, a folder full of files or a whole disk um, and tell us you know, what's there, file formats, uh, file format versions, uh, dates, all these sorts of things. Um, and we found the following. Um, so there are a number of existing tools which do a really excellent job of identifying the precise file format and version of digital files, um, such as Droid by the National Archives in the UK um, and Siegfried by Richard Lehane um, in Australia. Um, and these tools work by comparing the header or the footer of digital files um, to known signatures that are collected in file format registry databases um, the, the, the most popular of which is called Pronom, which is also maintained by the National Archives in the UK. Um, so this gives for far more accurate identification than can be, than can be done based on the, the file extension alone, uh, which is really important, especially when you're collecting back from the 80s. Um, I don't know how many of you were, were nerds then, um, but you know, originally, a lot of our file systems would only let us have 11 character file names. You had eight for the, uh, for the file name and then a three-digit extension. So it was perfectly acceptable practice in many places in the 80s and even into the 90s for people to use their initials as the file extension. It's also something that you can just erase. It's something that can be changed programmatically. Um, and it's something that's essentially arbitrary. You know, it's a, it's a convention that we follow. Um, so it's better for us uh, to know how to take the right preservation actions. We have to have more concrete information than that, and especially with things like CAD files, which are often not reverse compatible, we need to know not just the general type of file, but exactly what version and what software produced it. Um, so between these tools, we found that Siegfried had the best results and the fewest false positives for CAD files and other records in the CCA collection when we did some informal testing in 2015, 2016. And I know Richard Lehane actually has some benchmarks now between these tools, but they're all very comparable and they're all quite good decisions, I would say. Um, I have a clicker. Thank you. Um, so, however, while Droid and Siegfried can both identify multiple files at a time and even export these identifications into spreadsheet form, we found that none of the existing tools quite met our expectations for high-level profiling of files and disk images. Um, the Archaeology of the Digital Curatorial team had tried using the Droid's PDF reports, which you can, you can see above, um, but we found them a bit hard to read and missing some information that we, we considered pretty crucial. Uh, so luckily, I became aware of a project by Ross Spencer, a software developer and digital preservationist who was then working at Archives New Zealand, now works for Artifactual. Um, his project was called the Droid SQLite Analysis Engine, and the idea was uh, that it would take Droid's CSV you know, spreadsheet output, put that into a small database, and then query that database to generate uh, more human-readable reports, something that you know, even a layperson could come up and immediately understand. Um, I thought this was uh, quite a good idea, I still do, um, and so I sought out to implement something similar with Siegfried, which we had found worked a little bit better for our collections. Um, and since Siegfried already has a companion to tool named Roy, and I'm bad at naming things, um, it's called Brunhilde. Um, so from that origin, um, Brunhilde's grown more complex as users requested new features, um, such as running bulk extractor um, to scan for personally identifiable information, um, exporting files from disk images, uh, scanning files for viruses. Um, at this point, it's arguably as much a sort of minimal processing tool as it is a profiling one. Um, uh, what I think is quite cool is that it's now included as a standard tool in the BitCurator environment, um, and it's used by a number of other institutions, many of whom have actually contributed the code or the ideas to grow this into something that works better for all of us. Um, so including libraries or archives, just the ones I know about, at the University of North Carolina, North Carolina State University, Duke, the University of Michigan, and Grand Valley State. Um, so what does using Brunhilde actually look like? In essence, um, using either a command line or a graphical interface, um, you put uh, Brunhilde, you point it at a disk image or a folder of digital files, and based on your configuration, Brunhilde will run a set of tools against the files and then generate a set of machine-readable CSV reports and some human-readable and a human-readable HTML report. Um, so, looking at that that HTML report, um, essentially, uh, it breaks it down into a couple uh, some different categories. Uh, but for a given a given set of files, you have a sort of section at the beginning that says what versions of everything we're running and gives a little context. Um, then there are some high-level statistics, things like the total number of files, the total size the earliest and latest dates and a kind of date range, um, 
whether there are deleted files or duplicate files, um, this sort of thing. Um, gives you some detailed file format identification with links out to pronoms. So if you don't know what a file format is, you can click on it and get a little bit more description. Um, things like last modified dates by year, which can be really helpful for an archivist to get a, a quick sense of like, uh, you know, if we only have a range, there might be outliers kind of throwing it off. So to having a sense of where the bulk of the material is can be quite helpful. Um, as well as lists of files that, um, you know, were not able to be identified, uh, which is a really common thing at CCA, hopefully uh, less common now. Um, but I know this team probably contributed as many file format signatures to Pronom in the last couple of years as I'm sure some of our colleagues have beat us, but not many. Um, as well as duplicate files. Um, and this, so this looks at the checksums that Mireille mentioned, which is a sort of uh, ironclad signature of the content of a file, not file names. So even if things have different file names, they're in different directories, you can still find out which ones are, are the same. Um, uh, yeah, and as I mentioned, there's a graphical user interface, which for some things like uh, like setting the configuration the way you want um, can be quite a lot easier to use than, than the command line one. Um, so the other tool that I'm going to talk about, which is really a set of software programs um, that was developed alongside this project, are called the CCA tools. Um, the CCA tools, which consist of the disk image processor, the folder processor, and the SIP creator, uh, very original names, um, are basically a set of Python scripts um, with graphical interfaces that, uh, and the aim of these is to automate as much of the arrangement description and kind of like pre-ingest triage um, for files, directories, and disk images as possible, uh, including then uniformly packaging those files with checksums for transfer to Archivematica um, so that we can be sure that as we're transferring things from one location to another, uh, which is a moment where files are most prone to corrupt, um, that if anything happens, we catch that. Uh, again, the, the idea for these tools did not come out of thin air, um, but instead was based on Jess White's work, scripting together command line utilities for disk image preservation at the University of Toronto. Um, the CCA tools are developed specifically for the BitCurator environment and take advantage of many open source command line utilities installed there. Um, the repository on GitHub includes an installation script, which when you run it, installs all three utilities um, on, uh, in a folder on the desktop with launchers for the programs. Um, here you can see the graphical interface for the disk image processor. Um, it's pretty simple, but a lot easier than, than having to teach everyone how to use the command line. Um, this is arguably the most complex of the three tools, and I think the one that, that um, people outside the CCA have probably found the most helpful. Um, the disk image processor is designed for bulk appraisal and processing of disk images of legacy storage media, such as floppy disks, zip disks, and optical media. Um, so when you point it at a directory that contains disk images and, say, some accompanying files, like pictures of the floppy disks and log files from the disk imaging process, um, the disk image processor will characterize and extract files from every one of the disk images um, and start archival description of each disk by auto-populating factual elements of description, such as date ranges and extents based on what was found on the disk. And I think, um, I hadn't written this out, but I think maybe a little more context uh, might be helpful here. Um, so I think since the, the Big Curator project and related projects started, um, the Ames project in the, in the 2000s was certainly one of the, the early cases in North America of the archival world trying to, to tackle what it, what it means to do digital preservation and what communities we could borrow sort of standards and tools from. Um, one of the earliest communities that we reached out to and, and that still really informs our practice is the digital forensics community, which is actually largely law enforcement and sort of like bank regulators. Um, people investigate cases of fraud, this kind of thing. Um, and there's, there's more overlap between the two than you would think, um, mostly because um, both of our domains require um, very precise actions that are repeatable um, with clear audit trails. Um, because whether you want to try someone in court or whether you want to stake your dissertation on something, you have to be very, very, very sure that what you're looking at is authentic, uh, which is a lot harder in the digital world than, than the physical world. Um, so this idea of borrowing things like disk imaging from the digital forensics world hit on big uh, and early and is still very much with us um, and is still very helpful. But in some ways, it meant a lot of institutions went from like a stack of floppy disks or CDs to a kind of virtual stack of disk image files, uh, which are kind of like a black box. Um, and so this was sort of meant to try to help um, with that idea of like, okay, we've moved from something that's physical and degrading to a digital perfect facsimile of that. 
Um, but now we have to actually do something with those, understand what they are, appraise them, the same way that if we took in an archive full of paper, before we did anything, we'd survey it, we'd look through, we'd get to know the material. Um, okay, now I'll go back to the script. <laughs> Um, here you can see uh, the folder processor above um, and the SIP curator, which are very similar to the disk image processor and allow processing archivists to create Archivematica ready transfers and pre-populated description um, from directories or even a handful of files kind of taken from, from different places. Um, and our aim for the tools was to make sure that all the transfers going to Archimatica were uniform while taking advantage of the kind of flexibility of the bit curator environment, which gave us a lot more room for triage and arrangement work than was possible in Archimatica at the time. Um, and with you know, more recent developments like the appraisal tab in Archimatica, that's gotten better, but there's still a lot of utility to basically having a toolbox rather than a prescriptive workflow in a lot of cases. Um, and since I mentioned the pre-populated description a couple times now, um, this is a screenshot, <laughs> boring but hopefully helpful, um, of one of the CSV files created by the folder processor as a demonstration. Um, so as you can see, we get uh, machine accurate uh, dates, extent statements, and a minimal scope and content note, including things like the most common file formats, which a researcher might find helpful, as well as the name of the original directory, since we're probably gonna rename things to their, their identifiers in our collections database. Um, and by letting the bits describe themselves this way, um, the tools allow archivists to not spend all their time kind of right-clicking on folders to see how many files are in there, but instead to focus on the things that humans are good at, like contextualizing and providing good titles and you know, working on the higher level descriptions in a finding aid, the things that really help us sort of guide researchers to the place that they want to be rather than just mapping things as they are. Um, and I forget who this is, Alex. Yeah. I'm just gonna go back and forth like this all day. Um, so this, I'm gonna be talking to you now about arrangement and description. Um, at CCA, the first step to really processing born digital archives is arrangement. There are a few different approaches we take to arranging an archive, but typically born digital records are arranged either in separate born digital series, which I think sort of happens more often um, than we care to admit, but it seems to be the easiest, <laughs> the easiest way. In separate born digital subseries within existing series or co-arranged with other formats. We may take any of these pro approaches to an archive, but which approach is taken depends on a number of factors, including how the records arrive at CCA, either as large transfers or spread across smaller storage media, existing state of organization, context of creation and active use, anticipated researcher use, nature of archival collection to which they belong, especially for hybrid archives, institutional priorities, and Archivematica requirements and the requirements of our access interface for born digital archives. So similar to processing a physical archive, the level of work involved in the arrangement of digital records will vary between fonts. For some, we may keep and describe all files from a single piece of media together, and for others, we may separate directories that were stored together and arrange them into different series. Most often, we will seek to arrange born digital records with similar records in other formats, and except in extraordinary circumstances, we seek to arrange directories and not individual files. Um, so this brings us to packaging SIPs for Archivematica. Once we have a digital archive arranged, we use the CCA tools developed by Tim, folder processor and disk image processor, to package each SIP so that it meets our local requirements for ingest into Archivematica. Can I have the word? Thanks. Typically, the structure of our SIPs look like this. At the top directory, you will see that the SIP is named after a unique identifier and contains two folders an objects folder and a metadata folder. Within the objects folder, we simply include the digital objects to be ingested into Archivematica. And within the metadata folder, we include a checksum file, which is a manifest containing checksums for each file in the objects folder, as well as submission documentation folder containing any additional documentation relating to the digital objects. And those are just screenshots into a peak of an example within a SIP. And so once all of our born digital material is packaged into SIPs, we describe the archive according to archival standard ISAD-G, 
first entering information into spreadsheets that were, Tim showed you a little bit about, that are generated by the tools, and then into the museum system, or TMS, the database that we use at CCA to manage the collection. In principle, we follow the same practices used to describe born digital material as we do to describe physical archives. However, the one major difference is that we use these automation tools to provide the majority of technical description. This allows us processing archivists to focus on the descriptive information that, as Tim said, only a human is able to do. Um, and for example, machine actionable information such as extent, file formats, and file system metadata is captured automatically, while descriptive fields such as title, archive creator, and particular notes in the scope and context, content are updated by us. Typically, the lowest level of description we do is file level, and item level metadata is instead automatically generated by Archivematica and saved in the eight METS file for each digital file within a SIP. Finally, after arrangement and description are complete, SIPs can then be ingested into Archivematica. I think that brings us to you, Stefan. Uh, so hi, I'm Stefana. I still have an interview. I still haven't introduced myself, but uh, I'm the digital archivist at CCA. Um, I'm actually going to mention really quickly sort of our last uh, processing tool before we get into uh, Archivematica, um, and that's for email archiving. Uh, we use this great tool called EPAD, which is developed by uh, Stanford U University. Um, I will say as a disclaimer that we're doing this on a very small scale so far. Uh, we've had two email archives within um, uh, or two email inboxes within sort of our private archives. So just a few thousand emails, much smaller scale than what a lot of other places are doing, but we're hoping to gear it up into maybe something more um, substantial. Um, but basically how EPAD works is that you will upload a, an inbox file, basically the preservation format for email inboxes uh, to this software. Uh, we use something called Email Me to do that. Um, we use that instead of the, sort of the built-in bit curator um, tool to do email c conversion. Um, the reason for that is that there tends to be a lot of error with the, the in inbuilt bit curator tool. Um, but um, once once you've uploaded this inbox file to uh, to EPAD, uh, it actually allows you to do a really great um, sort of appraisal step, um, both through. Uh, uh, customizable lexicons and keyword searching. Um, so we use both of those features. Um, the lexicons are really great because they let you search across for certain keywords. Um, so we actually developed our own, um, one in English, uh, one sort of uh, in French with a, a bias towards uh, sort of the Quebecois slang in particular, um, and then also one in German. Uh, the German one is interesting. We don't actually have any German speakers who worked on that. <laughs> so it's... Um, um, kind of a, a beta version, but we found that it worked really great. Um, and, and the reason for that is because all of the email archives were obviously in different languages, because, but because it was an American university that developed this tool, um, it was you know English only. Um, and then we also use the, the keyword searching. Um, so that's uh, just to give you an example, we had an instance of a group of emails where people were talking about uh, the barbecue that they were planning that weekend. We didn't necessarily want to keep all of these barbecue emails, so you search barbecue, you restrict all of them, um, and once you've done all this restricting, you can uh, export the inbox format um, for long-term preservation uh, without kind of all of these uh, extraneous emails. Um, so with that, um, I'll talk to you a little bit about Archivematica. Um, Archivematica, if you're not familiar with it, is, our, is the uh, digital preservation software developed by Artifactual. Um, for, uh, we use it at CCA sort of um, for kind of uh, post-processing and uh, long-term uh, storage. Um, how it works is that once you finish processing, uh, um, you basically give Archivematica a SIP. Um, SIPs will, um, uh, Archivematica will take those SIPs and enact uh, sort of a series of microservices on them, which are um, sort of a, in a very long list behind me, but um, uh, overall it, it just uh, sort of characterizes and validates to make sure that they're the same as they were received, um, and in a lot of cases also normalizes them to whatever the preservation format or standard is. Um, once it's done that, it stores an APE, the, the preservation copy, um, which it will do fixity checking on over time. Um, we do that quarterly at CCA, um, as well as generates dips or access copies. 
Um, so everyone kind of sets up uh, Archive Matica differently. It's highly, highly customizable, which it makes it a really great tool for um, it's kind of such a diverse field like the one we work in. Um, I will say that we do have three different pipelines, sort of three different use cases for it at CCA. Um, the first for that is um, a kind of, uh, we call it our quote unquote uh, raw ingest pipeline. Um, that's sort of for um, unprocessed archives. Basically, we tell Archive Matica to do as little as possible to the SIPs that we're giving it. Um, so that way, um, the archivist kind of gets a really clean version when it's time to process. Um, so basically, things that we give that are unprocessed archives um, uh, or things that we feel that will be um, sort of sensitive in terms of formats and, and so forth um, that we don't want Archive Matica doing so much to. Um, the second pipeline is the exact opposite of that. Um, basically what that is, is uh, we give that all of the uh, process material um, and that enacts um, all of the really granular ones. That's the list you see behind me. Um, and the third pipeline we're uh, actually not using yet, but we're planning to uh, spin it up soon for our um, uh, library material. Um, and so that's sort of a middle path. We expect that our library material, uh, library-born digital material, will sort of be uh, the middle road, uh, less complicated than CAD and all of that, more like PDFs and MP4s, easier formats to preserve over time. Um, so we also do, uh, we're also really interested in sponsor development. Um, and I, I will say a, a lot of my uh, little talks today will be uh, as much of a pitch as anything. <laughs> um, but uh, sponsor development is something we're really interested in at CCA. Um, up to this point, uh, I would say our biggest project that we've done so far, uh, led by Tim uh, about a year ago, um, was to recreate um, or, or to rethink sort of the dip creation workflow um, in uh, sort of the Archive Matica storage services. Uh, basically, what we were finding is that uh, the, the way that Archive Matica was programmed to make uh, access copies, it was actually breaking all of the external references, which is a, a kind of a peculiarity to CAD files. Um, basically, they often reference other files, um, but when uh, Archive Matica would restructure these um, during processing, um, those, those references would break. Um, so we asked Archive Matica, uh, using sponsored development time, to um, kind of reprogram this so that uh, those are maintained over time. Um, so again, co-sponsoring uh, co development is something we're really interested in. If you happen to uh, work at an institution and find that Archive Matica is doing almost what you want it to do and that uh, this improvement you have in mind might also be beneficial to the CCA, uh, I'd love to talk to you about that. Um, uh, talk about that some more. Uh, it's definitely something we're really interested in. Um, Um, okay, I'll take the clicker again. So once we've done all this, well, as um, Stefana was mentioning, the goal is to give eventually access to our researcher. Uh, as Martin mentioned earlier, like we have in our study room, uh, two workstations with dedicated material on them to give access to, um, to our materials. So we will prepare until recently, we would prepare, um, we would extract the dips and then make them available on those computers, but Stefana will tell you about something new and exciting that we have. Um, what I want to tackle a bit more is um, how do we, uh, so once we've got this, like how do we actually access the file? So we have uh, the same similar, um, mostly the same uh, software on uh, those uh, CAD workstations than the ones we have in our um, preservation lab, uh, so a bunch of things uh, that we have, but we all know, and we've mentioned it before too, that one of the main issues with CAD files is that um, there's a lot of dependencies, there's a lot of libraries, and it's also, there's no uniform way to actually uh, open one in a new format, new version of the software, without knowing if we're missing information. For CCA, for our researchers, it's the process is important, and to be able that we, we know exactly that we're accessing all the information that the architect or the creator actually uh, included in their file is very important. Um, so one of the uh, views we're looking at it, we've been talking a bit about emulation, and uh, CCA was fortunate enough to have a collaboration with the American Institute for Architect 
for architects and uh, basically they had collected over the year uh, as um, in their reviewing of softwares for their magazine uh, a bunch of uh, software and a few hundreds actually and uh, so we partnered up with them we'll uh, disk image them and um, they will uh, and we'll send them back the uh, art copies and a version of the disk image and we'll retain a version of the disk images for emulation um, on our uh, CAD, uh, CAD stations for our researchers to be able to uh, open um, the, the files, ideally in the best version um, of the software or the version they were created in. Uh, of course, it's not all software that are there, but it's it gives us way more possibilities than we would have uh, had otherwise. Um, we are still with that possibility. It's not fully streamlined yet, like we're still in the midst of capturing. Uh, it takes a long time to capture all that. And uh, one of the important things too is to document uh, what are the settings necessary to actually be able to emulate uh, those software, like what's the operation system, uh, is there a dependency to a given type of hardware um, too. So, um, so yeah, we're also very, uh, as Sim mentioned earlier, we're really looking into uh, the work of a Yale University Easy Project, uh, which is sponsored and uh, developed with the Software Preservation Network, which is also um, a group we, we, we try to keep in touch with. Uh, they've also worked on the code for best practice and use uh, for software preservation. The thing is that software is something that is copyrighted. So it's, it can have impacts. Uh, there is a case for, uh, for fair use in an institution when it's like to, um, to get to open records and get to know what it is about, but we cannot go around and make a commercial use out of it. Um, so they did, uh, however, and the United States just got an exemption for the next three years on their um, uh, copyright law to uh, be able to go around at the digital rights management and in order to go to do act uh, preservation activities and access to records. So these are all uh, initiatives that we can definitely be benefit for on the long term, because uh, of course we want to be uh, very careful uh, with how uh, we use um, all of this. And yeah, I believe it, I'll pass it back to Stefana. All right, so I'm back to make a pitch again. Um, so pretty much uh, one of the biggest projects I've been working on in the past, um, oh gosh, like eight months now, um, is this uh, project called Scope. Um, so of course, everything that we do here is to provide access to, to our materials for researchers. Um, and we developed Scope as a digital access interface for born digital material. Um, what we had been finding was that our old workflow uh, for providing reference um, was actually getting to be pretty unsustainable. Um, basically, what would happen was, you know, like anywhere else, the researcher would let reference know, then uh, reference would call us, we'd query Archivematica, move the dips, restructure them, uh, move them to a shared folder, and then probably consult with the researcher if they didn't know how to use it too long. That was too much stuff. Um, and we were finding, actually, that every year we, get, we doubled the amount of researchers um, who are using our digital materials. It was four in 2017 and 10 last year. Um, so kind of anticipating this, this increase in usage, we realized that this was not going to be a sustainable workflow over time. Um, uh, and on top of that, we were sort of also realizing that um, you know, our finding aids are really great for kind of doing top-down research, but more and more uh, researchers were interested uh, in doing horizontal searching rather than being interested in a particular collection they wanted to search across the whole archive. Um, and our current kind of way of searching maybe wasn't the best way to do that. Um, so with all of this in mind, Tim actually developed a prototype in 2017 for Scope, uh, and now it's a fully uh, fledged, um, it's been completely developed by uh, Artifactual, the same um, producers as the, uh, for, Ar for Archivematica. Um, so how it works is um, that archives, uh, or archivists will upload dips to the interface. Um, you can kind of see behind me, um, this is the, the homepage for Scope. Um, we're missing a slide. Well, there is a homepage for Scope. Um, <laughs> from the homepage, you can browse and uh, choose, a um, uh, choose a particular collection that you might be interested in looking at. Um, so uh, like I said, this is really great for sort of this top-down searching. Um, 
So uh, sort of answering traditional questions. So the example I always give is, you know, what drawings do you have for the Zaha Hadid Faino Science Center? So you would click over to the, the Zaha Hadid uh, Faino Science Center collection, um, and you would um, select um, a particular dip or a group of access copies uh, that you're interested in downloading. Um, so you can see at the bottom, this is just a few, but it cuts off, but there's a whole list of all of the files that are available there, um, available for really granular searching. Um, and you can also, if you notice in the upper right hand corner, you can download that directly to um, the local workstation. Um, so that really, uh, I mean, reduces our reference workflow to uh, this back and forth between a number of stakeholders to uh, basically immediately, uh, however long it takes to download, uh, you know, your, your five gig dip. Um, uh, but like I said, it's also really great for horizontal searching. Um, so this is, a uh, so, you know, a good example question for that might be, uh, I'm doing research on the history of AutoCAD. Uh, can I see all of your earliest AutoCAD files? Um, so uh, if you type in the search bar, AutoCAD drawing, this is what comes up, and then you can sort it by last modified date. Um, and this is from across all of the archives. So um, I happen to know just based on uh, by the identifiers, and we are improving this interface a little bit, but I happen to know from the identifiers that some of them are those that Zaha Hadid ones, but there are also these also include files from the Foreign, Arch uh, foreign Office Architect font. Um, so it, again, cross-collection searching. Um, so uh, we now have a beta version up and working in our reading room. Um, researchers still have to request dips um, for particular, in, like in particular, but we're hoping to have our entire collection uh, uploaded. Uh, we also just kicked off a second phase of development, uh, which is really exciting for us. We have uh, two pretty substantial uh, changes that are going to be made to this version. Um, the first of that is that it will hopefully be integrated with our Archivematica storage. Um, this means that. Uh, the processing archivists don't have to upload dips one at a time. You can uh, either just go and, you can basically just tell Scope to go and grab all of them or kind of make a selection from there. Um, this is, again, greatly reducing our reference workflow. Um, and we're also to, hoping to improve the searching, um, obviously based on what we have behind us. So there, there are some things left to be, uh, that are to be desired. Um, for example, we're gonna be adding filtering and fastening. Um, so, you know, I'm only interested in the Zaha Hadid papers. Uh, I'm only interested from a certain group of years, uh, et cetera. Uh, and we're also hoping to add uh, content-based tagging um, that will be uh, customizable by institution. Um, uh, and then on top of that, you know, we're always improving kind of user experience as well as sort of back-end upgrades. Um, so this is the pitch part. It is free and open source. So <laughs> we do encourage you uh, to download the beta version and use it. Uh, even better, if you have some ideas for scope and would like to either contribute ideas or code, um, that's something we're more than happy to, to, to uh, take on. Uh, we're really hoping that this is not usable just for CCA, but uh, kind of broadly and across different institutions. Oh, it's me again. Um, <laughs> Um, so uh, kind of moving from our workflow to sort of just other archiving activities that we do at CCA. Um, we've also been doing um, a bit of web archiving as well. Um, this relates less to the archaeology of the digital, but uh, kind of broadly just uh, archival activities. Um, so web archiving has kind of always been a pet project of mine, sort of wherever I go. And uh, when I came to CCA, I kind of did a little bit of research into kind of what uh, web archive co uh, collections exist sort of within the architecture world. Um, and it turns out there are uh, quite a lot of them. Um, but they all tend to be really, um, well, most of them are based in the States. For example, the Avery, uh, the Avery Archive at Columbia is a, the biggest example there. Um, there are also quite a few in the Middle East, but they all tend to be from um, sort of really local uh, projects, uh, public projects most often. Um, and they kind of um, didn't cover a lot of these sort of international monumental architecture projects um, that CCA often is interested in and, and collects. Um, there also uh, tended to be an interest from donors, um, so we'd get people's records and they'd also, um, you know, they'd, they'd give us all of our, their files and they'd say, oh, also if you're interested in our website, um, but we didn't necessarily have any uh, kind of comprehensive way of collecting that. Um, so with all of that in mind, uh, we ended up last summer subscribing to Archive It, um, which if you're not familiar with it, is a, a subscription-based web archiving service um, given by the uh, Internet Archive. Um, so we, I'm missing a slide again. 
Um, well, anyway, uh, we tend to uh, collect three types of materials. Um, the first is sort of architecture e-publications. That's at the request of our library. We see more and more that uh, architecture publications will only publish online. That's sort of by design. Um, but as publishers and non-archivists, they maybe uh, aren't, uh, don't have longevity in mind in these projects. So um, this is a great opportunity to collect these while they're still online. Um, the, I would say the biggest group of our collections is uh, CCA-created content. Um, so not only do we have a, an enormous website with a huge amount of publications on it, uh, we've actually, uh, since CCA has been so interested in sort of digital, the digital for so long, uh, we actually have exhibition websites going back to the early 2000s. Um, uh, thirdly, we also, as I mentioned before, have uh, websites related to our archival fonds. Basically, if there's anything um, sort of kind of necessary to do research on a particular fonds that's on online only, we'll go ahead and capture that as well. Um, so once, uh, once they've been captured uh, by the Archivet service, um, we make them available uh, through the Archivet landing page, um, basically how Archivet works, and the, unfortunately my slide doesn't show it, but uh, there's a landing page for each institution that uses it, and it will link out to all of those captures. Um, we also link it out, we also catalog them in our library catalog and link out that way. Um, so two points of access there. Um, uh, so Archivet is really great for things like the CUCA website that's you know mostly HTML, it's really huge, um, and uh, but overall relatively simple in terms of the code that's underneath it. Um, but uh, there are a lot more kind of difficult crawls um, that are um, maybe archive it as kind of a, a not the tool that you want to use. Uh, so for more difficult crawls, things with like J J Java Flash, uh, interactive media, things you need a password for, um, we use Web Recorder. So how Web Recorder works is that um, you basically click through every single page yourself and it records that experience. So if you log into, onto your Facebook uh, using Web Recorder, it'll show your targeted ads, all of your friends, and not just the generic um, Facebook homepage. Um, so basically, we still provide access through Archive It. We just download all the web archiving files called works. It's the preservation format. Um, and then uh, uh, upload those to Ar Archive It. And Archive It is, again, the access point there. And that was the landing page. <laughs> yeah, hi, back to me. Um, <clears throat> So basically what I'm going to talk about is uh, we try, one of the things we would like to get better over time is uh, the actual um, process between our donors and uh, ourselves into transferring the digital archives, as um, Alex mentioned before. Uh, so we have that form which we ask our donors to fill. Uh, some of it is very technical, but then in another step we then determine like um, how they're going to actually uh, package uh, package in a way um, their uh, their records in order to transfer it to us um, in some cases we've asked people to use bagger which is you know this very uh, easy interface for um, people that are not familiar uh, with digital archiving and digital preservation don't get me wrong though I, th I think it allows uh, it has a nice flexibility to allow to gather some precious data uh, but I feel like sometimes for people outside the field it's not that very um, easy to use and uh, so we started researching so yeah we had that process where we engage with our donors to make sure that we gather as much information as we can as uh, mentioned by my colleagues and then when we get to the transfer what we would like to have is make sure that we capture um, some metadata uh, beforehand uh, to have like the for example the checksum generated by our donors and the use of bagger and pr so then we c when we uh, receive them we can actually validate the integrity of the files and make sure that nothing has been lost in the process um, so what we've been doing is we've been going through uh, reviewing what's out there, uh, what other institutions have been doing. Um, so we've looked at different projects. For example, um, Simon Fraser University has developed a little um, a little application that is called Move It, and uh, it's like in three click you have something, but then we cannot add metadata. Uh, we also have uh, exactly from AVP that also it, um, works a bit like Bagger in the sense that you can. Um, 
uh, add a form and uh, modify some of the, the parameters and you can actually um, program um, the transfer, but it's still things we need to, to see uh, a little uh, more forward. And other projects like the very uh, nice uh, ANS project from um, uh, uh, New York uh, uh, State uh, University, uh, Albany uh, University, which uh, those little ants there, which is kind of nice uh, finding, uh, but more based for Windows, which most of our donors also use Macs. So, so we're still uh, thinking about it, but in an ideal world, we would want to have our donors to get into an interface, add some metadata information as the ones we collect on our form, and just go and uh, point to the directory uh, where the data is, and it being uh, captured at that point with the uh, production of the metadata and the checksums that would allow us to, uh, to validate uh, the transfer. Uh, another of the very promising um, projects ongoing, but still not there yet with the, uh, uh, the interface, uh, is the Rockefeller Archive Center uh, archives, uh, which have been uh, uh, to the Project Electron, uh, working on the Aurora um, uh, system, which uh, allows to uh, receive uh, and process, appraise and process, and then transfer to their uh, digital archive uh, the sum of their work. So, still on the look, but uh, also, yeah, we'll, we'll try to get it better for our donors out there. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk briefly about a project that's very much ongoing and that I actually started after I uh, left the CCA, but that was really deeply informed by our work here and by, uh, again, some of those gaps that we noticed in, in the workflows as we were building them up. Um, and uh, I apologize for those of you who are at At Risk North to the recent um, Canadian Association of Research Libraries event on digital preservation, because you've probably heard just about everything I'm gonna say, um, but it's like five minutes, so it's okay. Um, so Bulk Reviewer um, is the name of a software application I started working on this past summer uh, as a summer fellow at the Library Innovation Lab at Harvard University, um, and that I'm continuing to work on now at Concordia, um, and hopefully will continue working on for the next, uh, next little while. Um, the idea for this application came from my experiences implementing digital uh, preservation workflows here at CCA. Um, as well as conversation at the 2017 BitCurator Users Forum, which was a conference that was held at Northwestern University in Chicago uh, with a number of uh, the, the users of the BitCurator software and a number of the members of the BitCurator consortium. It kind of gives us a, a place to all get together in a room and, and talk about what we're doing and learn from each other and um, sort of talk about what the, what the future growth of the project might look like. Um, and there was one particular conversation where we were uh, in, trying to identify these gaps, and we realized that basically everyone in the room had the same problem, um, which was for, particularly for workflows relating to the discovery and management of personally identifiable information um, and other kinds of private and sensitive information in digital archives, uh, which we have both legal and moral responsibilities to manage carefully um, and so that we don't end up, say, doxing our donors. Um, but, um, but where the, the tooling isn't really quite there. Um, so there are many types of sensitive information that might be present in faculty papers, business records, research data, other types of digital assets, certainly in architectural archives as well. Um, and some of these, things like national identifiers, like a SIN or a social security number, um, credit card numbers, phone numbers, we're, we're used to thinking about and, and we're used to thinking about as potentially problematic. Um, there's a lot of other kinds of data that can persist on digital devices that we don't necessarily think about, but that can be equally problematic. Uh, things like traces of internet search history uh, or GPS data that might be embedded in, in images or even in the, the kind of empty space in between files on a disk. Um, these are perhaps less obvious, but also important, um, especially as more and more uh, of computing and communication happens on mobile devices. Um, and given that it's only a matter of time before that, that begins to be part of the data that we receive in, in places like libraries and archives. Um, so as I mentioned, in addition to any legal requirements that we must follow, libraries, archives, and museums have a responsibility to conduct good faith screenings for such information, um, but there presently exists little consensus about what constitutes a, a sort of best faith uh, approach. Certainly we can't go and read through the documents of every file that comes in. 
We've never done that with our physical archives, um, and, and we can't really do it with our digital ones either. Um, so in practice, this means that the presence or even the potential presence of this kind of information um, has had a freezing effect, keeping collections in our backlogs and out of our users' hands. Um, this is in part because identifying such information can be difficult, as most digital archives by their nature are messy and unstructured data encoded in a wide range of file formats and file systems, many of which are from computers that uh, there aren't that many people around still who, who are experts on. Um, however, it's also and maybe primarily because the existing tools in the domain, things like Bulk Extractor, which is uh, involved in BitCurator and which we, as well as many other institutions use, um, and Forensics Toolkit, uh, which Alex mentioned earlier, are primarily designed for police and forensics investigators, not for librarians and archivists, and so they don't actually quite satisfy our list of user needs. Um, so for instance, these tools can be very effective at finding sensitive information, but notably, notably do not include functionality for then taking action on the offending data so that the broader set of files can be shared. Um, so if you think about the use cases for these tools, I think it's really informative, like Bulk Extractor, um, which was developed by Simpson Garfinkel, who um, for a long time taught at the Naval Postgraduate School, so the, the, Navy's, the US Navy's Graduate School, and now um, I believe it's like the director of cybersecurity or something like that at the US Census Bureau. Um, if you look at the user manual for Bulk Extractor, the kinds of use cases are very different than the kinds of use cases that we're talking about today. It's things like you've received three hard drives, you have a, a person in custody, you have to charge them within 24 hours, determine whether they're committing credit card fraud or not. It's, it's, a, it's a whole different world, but these are the tools that we've inherited. Um, so, uh, this summer, with 11 weeks of dedicated time due to the generous support of the Library Innovation Lab, um, I began working on a free and open source software application to try to fill the gap. Um, between June and August, I created a functional prototype of Bulk Reviewer um, using technologies like Django and, and Vue.js. Um, and this prototype allows users to scan a directory or disk image for various types of sensitive information, review the results, uh, generate reports, and then create file exports that actually separate out the files that might need to be run through some kind of redaction software or restricted from end users from the ones that are fine and can be uploaded to, say, like a digital library platform or shared with researchers in, in a reading room. Um, so here you can see a screenshot. This is actually a month or two old at this point, so it's, it looks a little different now. Um, but it's the current Bulk Reviewer browser application, um, uh, as well as a, a little screenshot from the GitHub repository showing that there's many, many open issues. Um, so I'm currently in the process of tying up some of the most crucial, the outstanding elements, um, with the aim of putting out a first 0.1.0 you know, release um, that can be shared and, and hopefully tested by the uh, community um, in the, the coming months and years. Um, so the development roadmap, um, First, as I said, I want to get the current prototype to a stable release so that it can be shared, um, tested, and put into use. Um, the first release won't contain all the features that I or, or other people would like to see in the tool, but hopefully it will be a minimum viable product. Uh, it's quite larger than I thought a minimum viable product would be you know, almost a year ago. <laughs> um, but which will be usable now and become more kind of fully featured, um, scalable, and easy to install and use with time. Um, following this first release, some of the stuff on the development roadmap uh, that's kind of high priorities are integrating additional scanners for things like banking information, personal health information, um, and customizable lexicons like those found by EPAD. Um, there may be plenty of things that are sensitive that we don't want to restrict by default, but that may and should give us pause um, and stop to make us give careful considerations over what we can give access to, things like, uh, like sexual orientation, uh, people's intimate, like the intimate personal details of people's lives. Um, a sort of second priority is making Bulk Reviewer fit for a Canadian context. Um, like most of the tools we've talked about today, um, Bulk Extractor was developed in the United States, which means it, uh, the interface is in English, it really only works on English material, uh, and it only really looks for US national identifiers, which doesn't serve us very well on this side of the border. Um, so doing things like adding a scanner for social insurance numbers, adding translations to the user interface, and trying to make some tweaks to make sure that the, the quality of the results is higher for non-English sources. Um, and some improvements to the sort of architecture, code quality, user interface, and user experience. Um, finally, I hope to experiment with adding a machine learning layer to Bulk Reviewer um, with the intention of making the results more context aware reducing the number of false positives and prioritizing results of risk for the human sitting down. Um, one thing that's kind of common is 
the way the application so far works and the way bulk extractor works is it, it searches, it essentially pulls the data out of, uh, out of a device or files uh, as plain text and, or Unicode text. Um, and then it conducts regular expression searches, basically searching for particular uh, patterns. Uh, so it'll look for everything that's a nine digit number with dashes in a certain place. But there can be all kinds of things that are not valid SINs or social security numbers that still fit that profile. Uh, so looking at technologies that might be able to analyze a result in the context of a larger document and compare that to test cases that we've trained it on uh, might make this uh, quite a bit more efficacious for us. Um, this isn't without its difficulties. Um, I think I'll have a fun time with the, the ethics review board. <laughs> um, finding and creating representative test data uh, that's accurate and yet not, uh, not a privacy problem for the people who created the files will be a real challenge. Um, but it promises to increase the quality of the resulting product and might be a really interesting case study of a practical application for artificial intelligence technology in libraries that's less of the sort of normal blockchain hype and more uh, sort of tailored, small-scale, uh, practical application, hopefully. Um, so I'll end with a plug. Um, contributions of code or ideas are always welcome, um, and I'd be really happy to discuss any potential collaborations uh, with people if, uh, if this struck an interest or if it seems useful to you. Oh, and that brings us to the end. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Martine, you want to? So thank you very much. Uh, for, sure the, uh, for sure the bulk reviewer is um, interesting to us, because I know, for example, we received old computers of which the donor said, I'm sure there's uh, invoices of the nanny on it. But he was not able to delete them before he would send us the computer. So who knows? Anyway, we would like to open now um, uh, this uh, session for discussion and questions. You can ask any question you want. We also have people in the back um, to see if there's questions coming from elsewhere. So not from here, but from elsewhere in the world. Um, and I know that we are a little bit limited in the time, but I hope you allow us to go a little bit over 12 to make sure that we can answer questions or remarks or comments or things you disagree with, maybe even. Uh, so please don't be shy. Uh, we have uh, microphones, and because we're recording this, we would like you to ask your question through the microphone. So who could I first? Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah, there's a very common topic you mentioned briefly, which is bit rot. I should stand up, shouldn't I? Um, and I've had extended discussions with people about how serious of an issue it is. Uh, once had an argument about whether audio should be stored on vinyl or an LPCM for archive. Um, and you seem to be very confident in the future and, uh, and how you're going to keep your data intact. Uh, so my two related questions are firstly, if you've found any physical formats you've worked with that are more or less resilient, uh, notably to bit rot. And secondly, what are you planning to do to make sure that in 50 and 100 years what you've archived remains bit perfect? Um, well, I can answer that. Um, so uh, like I said, was mentioning before, we use um, Archivematica as our digital preservation system. It's sort of less about physical media, um, but more about uh, having as many copies and making sure they're staying the same over time. And if uh, we actually do quarterly checks, we had one this past Saturday actually, um, and we saw that all but one of our, uh, I think we have 1,400 apes right now, um, all but one of them passed, all but one of them are exactly the same. So for this leftover one, we'll just restore it to uh, another copy. We have um, three locations of all of our data. Um, one is here at CCA, there's another one um, also on the island, and then there's a third um, sort of in, um, off the island as well, it's kind of important to have um, this distributed so that each uh, copy has like a different uh, sort of um, risk uh, risk level. Um, is there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, my, um, I think probably the the most helpful thing I've ever read on on this is um, an article by David Rosenthal called um, "Digital Preservation from the Ground Up." I think, um, and the reason why it's really helpful is he takes the concept of threat modeling. Um, and applies it to digital preservation, which I think is, is extremely helpful. Um, so like the things that are the most likely threats to a digital file 
uh, are that it corrupts or somehow changes, probably silently, unless you're, you're doing periodic auditing, um, because of things like network glitches, hardware failures, because in the end, everything's physical and material and entropy kind of rules. Um, other things are single points of failure. This tends to be in the real world where things happen. People are overly confident about like their organization um, being distributed within itself and they forget that the organization itself is a single point of failure for economic and political reasons um, as well as just because um, most system failures in hardware systems are correlated. Um, so you know, if it's something with the software that's syncing all the copies, it doesn't really matter if those copies are all spread out, if they're all affected by this single chain. Um, so I think using this kind of threat modeling is really helpful. I think um, in, in just determining, and the truth is we can't talk about 50 years, but we can talk about 10 years, and we can try to make sure that our institutions are resilient enough and well-staffed and well-funded enough um, that we can just continue to assess these things over time and that we continue to update our policies and, and uh, and all of this. I think the other question, which is really interesting that you raised, is the format question. Like, should we keep things analog? Should we keep them digital? If they're digital, is one format better than another? Um, and yeah, certainly some formats are better than, than others um, in the sense that for an uncompressed format, if you have like a wave or broadcast wave file and a single bit flips, you, the end user might not even notice the difference, likely won't, um, depending on where that bit was in the file. Um, if the same thing happens for a highly compressed MP3, the whole file can become unplayable. Um, so in that case, certain formats are much more resilient than others. But I would say that we've focused as a profession a little bit too much on that, forgetting that we've put an enormous amount of effort into trying to make sure that those changes won't happen and that when they do, they can be caught and reversed in real time. Um, and a lot of that is based on distributed storage, um, using different media, reducing our risks that way, and periodically auditing by like checking our manifests and checking our checksums against what's actually stored. Um, but it can also happen other ways, and I think in the future, like there's, we have a lot of things like self-healing file systems now, which can be a little more efficient at that, things like ZFS, they're like not quite production worthy yet, but you know, in a couple of years they likely will be, or like arguably they still are. But um, uh, but all to say, if we build our systems intelligently enough and we're really critical about them while we're building them and while we're maintaining them um, and we have faith in them and we resource them appropriately, the question of what happens when a file changes irreversibly should be kind of moot because we should never get there. Um, and I think a lot of institutions are still hedging their bets in a lot of ways where like if we have digital media, they're keeping the floppy disk and they're disk imaging it and they're keeping that disk image and they're exporting the files and they're keeping those files and they're migrating those files to a preservation file format and they're keeping those. And then when you consider that that means from one source we now created five copies and then we distributed those multiple times um, in a world where the climate's changing very rapidly and it's definitely our fault, um, super unsustainable practices like that probably aren't the best idea. That might have been a little long, but I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Other questions, or remarks, or comments? Could I ask you, any one of you, to explain us where you are at with your digital preservation or giving access to your files or your collections? No one? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. Um, hi, I'm I'm here on behalf of um, um, a Canadian network of uh, independent media artists, and um, these questions are absolutely. Uh, crucial to um, the artists and, and organizations that, that uh, collect and maintain those works. Um, and I'm very fascinated by everything that I've heard this morning, um, and I also feel quite uh, daunted by uh, the question of resourcing all of these solutions. Uh, I feel, I, I mean, without really knowing much about the detail, uh, it seems to me that uh, all of these solutions are absolutely labor-intensive labor and also quite capital-intensive. And I'm wondering, 
the question that we have to ask ourselves as a very um, uh, HR poor and, and resource poor community is how can we apply these appropriate solutions uh, to a context where you know there, there, there isn't a large institution that's behind this kind of work and there isn't really money in the system to, uh, to allow us to, to flesh out the strategies as we, as we really ought to be doing. I'm certainly not able to solve that problem, obviously, but um, what I can say, well, at least my experience is, um, it is, yes, a one, on the one hand, an issue of money, and as uh, I think the team was saying, economic uh, efforts. Uh, it's also an issue of knowledge. Uh, so this is not just, um, uh, that is a matter of, let's say, that people need to be trained in a different way, or additionally, I would say. Um, I think that's like across the board from archivists to also architectural historians or people that investigate things and so forth. But I will also say, coming back to the economic aspect of it, it's true you have to at one point make choices also uh, as an institution, for example. Clearly the CCA has made the choice and to prioritize um, this and it meant uh, that we uh, decided not to do other things. Now obviously it's, it is not a place to but I mean, we did, really did decide whether we would uh, put our effort and focus not just only in, let's say, cash, but especially in human resources, like are we hiring different kinds of people, which, which means we're not doing other things. So I'm sure that we have a backlog of other things or we haven't been addressing, you can you know, criticize us for not addressing other aspects in architectural history or contemporary architecture. But we really felt we needed to do it. And I think as any institution, you have to make these decisions. So yeah, it's not always nice. It can be painful. But I think you have to, at one point, decide we're going to do this. I heard a lecture of um, one of the main librarians of the National Archives in the Netherlands. And they have been digitizing their national library material. And she was very clear, and she said, we really had to make a choice to put all our efforts in uh, and all our uh, people in to gain this uh, uh, objective to make um, library material online accessible. Yeah, they didn't do many other things during that period of five or six years. It was a massive project. So yeah, then you, then you don't do other things. I think it's the, you have to be smart about it in a way. But I will also say that it looks a very big thing, and at the same time, you can do, I think, as we hoped, as I hope we could, we have been explaining here, at least the way we've been doing it, we've taken small steps, uh, and that's the only way to go. It's not a very sexy conclusion, but um, is the way it is. Yeah. I also say we spoke uh, in light of this with, uh, in terms of an artistic work, with uh, Rafael Lorenzo Hammer, for example who is concerned about his digital archives, an artist here in Montreal, and um, he explained to us, it was very interesting, that um, he is very specific about what to keep and what to preserve in each work of art of him. Others are not interested at all, but he said, so for one work, I will say that it's the bulbs that are very important, and for another work, and not the software, uh, you can migrate whatever you want, and for other works, it is actually more software-related um, issues, so I think, it, again, it's also even for him doing his work, it is prioritizing uh, within that work too. Yeah. Any questions uh, from the back? Not yet. Uh, maybe I just said uh, just a little thing like in the small step that you have, already knowing what you have is already like step, very step one. If you know what you have, you know what kind of actions you might need to take upon, and capturing it in a way that you know you can assess um, can also be another small step. Of course, it might need like technical material, but just trying to, yeah, understanding and capturing a basic element, uh, the basic elements of what you have can always be a first step uh, towards, hopefully, other uh, further steps into uh, making sure you, you conserve it on a long time. Other questions? Comments? Um, 
I might add something, um, which is that I think this question comes up a lot, and, and the truth is that at this point, the people doing digital preservation just tend to be the very highly resourced institutions, um, national libraries, national archives, um, you know, well-funded museums, libraries, universities, this kind of thing. Um, but that's not, that's not exclusively where the need lies, clearly. Um, whether it's artists, whether it's like, private practitioners in all kinds of fields, uh, whether it's community archives, um, you know, often it's the most marginalized folks among us whose voices we have to preserve the most and who have the fewest resources to do it. Um, so to my mind, I think, you know, we can be smart and do like the sort of maximal effort with the minimal resources, maybe even just like making sure you're keeping a copy of your stuff in multiple cloud services, for instance, and sort of like just trying to slowly reduce risk is great. Um, but ultimately, I think it's going to have to be a societal change too. And the infrastructure is probably going to have to come from the people with money, um, from a governmental level or a consortial one or from universities or something. Um, so I would really like to see the people with the resources step up to the plate. Um, I think it's probably uh, pretty deeply needed. Um, I'd ac actually like to say something on this topic because I think I'm in a very similar situation where I just have access. I've basically taken on dealing with a bunch of random media from many, many sources and hardware, some of which works, some of which does not. And uh, we're in a situation right now where with a lot of older formats, particularly like floppy floppies, five and a quarters or eight inch if you have that somehow, um, every day you don't do something with that is a day that you may be potentially losing uh, a data that's gonna be relevant to whether or not you can even open your files anymore. Um, so I kind of take the attitude that with a lot of that stuff, if you don't think realistically that soon you're going to be able to handle it in a proper forensic way, at the very least take the weekend uh, pl plug. Okay, you'd have to actually build a computer to work with five and a quarter, but say regularly you've got three and a half inch floppies, get a USB floppy drive, take the weekend, plug it into a machine with Linux running on it, and run a DD command on it, and it's not ideal. You might modify the data on the disk a bit, but at least you've done something because tomorrow that data might be gone uh, because these are not necessarily the most resilient formats, uh, especially more recent floppy disks are actually worse at storing data, more recently made. Um, so do the not so good thing now if you don't think you're gonna be able to do it properly in the next year or two. That's my attitude. Thank you. Any other remarks? Well, then I'd like to thank everyone for especially uh, Stefana, Tim, uh, Alexandra, and Mireille, and the people in the back, uh, the people filming and the people uh, preparing all this uh, work. Um, and I want to thank you, the audience, also elsewhere. And if you do have questions, don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, you know probably where to find us, uh, but if not, just come to us. Uh, we're very happy to share or to also get critique. Um, so uh, don't be shy, again. Um, so for the afternoon session, to come to a bit more practical information, we will start at 1.30. Yeah. It is in the Shaughnessy House. Um, I know, I mean, most of you are from here, so you know that there's a lot of places where you can grab something uh, quickly or longer, whatever, um, uh, around the CCA. And uh, we will come back at 1.30 for the afternoon session where we have multiple sessions at the same time, but we first will discuss as a group uh, what you think uh, you would like to have addressed and to go into even more detail uh, on these topics that uh, we have been discussing this morning. Thank you again, thank you for coming, thank you for tuning in, and uh, we hope to see you soon again. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>